Let's take a look at some applications of Pascal's principle. This is a diagram of a hydraulic lift, which is often used to lift very heavy things like cars. It is filled with a confined hydraulic fluid and two pistons of different sizes. The idea is that a force exerted on one piston will produce an added pressure that is transmitted undiminished throughout the entire fluid and to the other piston. In order to use a small force to lift a heavy car, on which piston should the car be placed? This is not drawn to scale, but the heavy car should be placed on the big piston because the pressure should be the same on the both sides. So pressure on one side equals to the pressure on the other side. And we know that pressure equals to force divided by area. So this is a force on one side divided by the area on that side equals to force on the other side divided by the other piston's area. That means the side with the larger piston gets to have a larger force. In this hydraulic lift, the diameters of the two pistons are 0.1 meter and 0.3 meters. A 1500 kilogram car is to be lifted by the large piston. What force has to be applied to the small piston? When the small piston is pushed down by 5 centimeters, how far is the car lifted? Because the pressure is the same on the two sides, the force divided by area has to be the same on the two sides. The force on one side is F, we don't know. The area is pi r squared. The radius is half the diameter. On the other side, the force is the weight of the car, 15,000 newtons. The area is pi r squared, and the r is 0.3 divided by 2. And we can cancel the pi's on the two sides and the 1 half squared on the two sides. So what's left is f divided by 0.01 equals to 15,000 newtons divided by 0.09. If we cross multiply, we'll be able to find that the force is 15,000 divided by 9, which is 1667 newtons. So that's the force we need to lift something that's much heavier. Another way to look at this is the diameter of the two pistons is 1, 2, 3. That means the area, which is pi times half diameter squared, is proportional to d squared because pi is a constant, the one half squared is a constant. That means the area or the d squared would be 1 to 9. Since the force divided by area has to be the same on the two sides, that means the force must be 1 to 9 as well because 1 divided by 1 would equal to 9 divided by 9. So we know the force must be one ninth of the larger force on the other side. Now let's look at how far the car will go up when the small piston is pushed down by five centimeters. There are two ways to do this. One is to look at the work done. This simple machine can help us save force, but we can never save work. So the work input has to equal to the work output if we don't consider any energy being lost to friction. So the work on one side is the force times the displacement. Now this d is not the same as this d. This is the displacement, not the diameter. Okay, And uh, times the cosine. And uh, I'm not going to worry about the cosine part because the cosine is just going to be 1. On the other side, I have force 2 times the displacement 2. And uh, so the force on one side is 1667 times 5 centimeters equals to the force on the other side times the d 
displacement on the other side. Now, notice how I just used the 5 centimeters. I did not bother to change it to 0.05 meters because you don't have to. Because I have D and D on the two sides. If I use centimeters for this D, I'm just going to get centimeters as well for the other side. So this will give me D2, that is 5 centimeters divided by 9. So if we use simple machine to save force, we'll have to travel longer distance. So on this side, the car doesn't go up as much. Another way to solve this problem is when the small piston goes down, this volume of the fluid gets displaced. And uh, this piston goes up, and this volume over here should equal to the volume of the fluid that gets displaced on the other side. So the volume on the two sides must be equal. The volume of a cylinder equals to the cross-sectional area times the height of the cylinder. The, so the volume is area times the displacement. So it's A1, D1 equals to A2, D2. If you plug in the area for the two pistons, and then the 5 centimeters over here, you'll get the same D2. We can also use the ratio to do this problem. The force is 1 to 9. That means the displacement has to be 9 to 1 because 1 times 9 equals to 9 times 1. So if we get to save force, so the force is 1 ninth of the resistant force, then we have to travel 9 times the distance. So the car will only go up 1 ninth of the 5 centimeters. Or if we say the volume is the same, since the cross-sectional area is 1 to 9, that means the displacement has to be 9 to 1, we get the same result. Here I have a demonstration model of a hydraulic lift. The blue liquid inside is just water with food coloring. To make the small piston go down, I only have to push with a small force. To make the big piston go down, I have to push much harder. And of course, to do the same amount of work, the smaller force has to travel a longer distance. The larger force travels a smaller distance. For this incompressible fluid, the volume of fluid on this side should equal to the volume of fluid on that side. The hydraulic brake system we use for cars is similar to hydraulic lifts. It helps us save force. When you step on the brake pedal, you add an extra pressure to the brake fluid inside the master cylinder, which is transmitted throughout the entire confined fluid to the brake pads or brake shoe of each wheel. The brake pads or brake shoes then apply friction to the wheel rotors or wheel drums to slow down your car. Another great advantage of hydraulic brakes is the brake fluid lines. These flexible lines make it easy to route around parts of the car to reach all wheels. And your foot on the brake pedal does not have to feel any movement at the wheels.